Blood Beyond the Rose The George Beatty Story by Barry Dominic Graham Narrated by Peter Baker This audiobook is profoundly dedicated to the dear memory of George Beatty, Esquire, and also that of my late lamented brother, John Molloy, both having left this world too soon. Prologue Obituary from the Montrose Review on Thursday, October 9th, 1823 it is with no ordinary feelings of regret that we have to record the death of Mr. George Beatty, writer here, which happened on the 29th Ultimo. In his professional capacity, Mr. Beatty was eminent for his integrity, abilities, and conciliatory disposition, which made him regard what was just rather than what was scientific as a scholar, nay, as a philosopher. His mind was stored with whatever is excellent in literature, and he admired whatever is grand, impressive, and interesting in nature. He was both a man of observation and reflection, and his remarks were listened to with that degree of attention which a superior judgment always commands. Above all, as a man, as an upright, independent, generous, and sociable man. He was honoured, esteemed, and beloved. Nor was this tribute paid to the qualities of his heart in a common or partial degree, but warmly and generally. His satirical powers, which, keeping a judicious aim, become an active virtue itself, were elucidated in many instances and thrown with subtle keenness against vice, folly, and corruption. In testimony of this, he has left behind him many admired specimens, both in prose and verse. The milder effusions of his genius abound in sentiment and pathos, equal at least to many of the more lauded poetical pieces of the day, and had he prosecuted with ardour that gift with which he was favoured, he might— have laid claim to a palm which a less qualified muse may now possess. His humour was unbounded, and was of such a nature that it delighted all who had the honour of his acquaintance, without hurting the feelings of any. He was a firm patriot, a universal philanthropist, and a warm friend. Noble, generous, honest, modest, unassuming, feeling. He was a man who mixed with opposite parties, and was equally beloved by all. It may be thought by those who shared not the pleasures of his society, that this outline of Mr. Beatty's character and qualities is a laboured panegyric, and we confess that of an individual at a distance we should have suspected so. But to those who knew him, it will appear only an attempt to draw the contour of a picture which every one admired in its natural perfection. As public journalists, we have no right to intrude with our own private feelings in lamenting the death of this worthy and valuable member of society, but it would have been doing injustice to the public, whose concern is deep upon this occasion, to have said less, and we are assured that no one will contradict us when we declare that no man in this town and neighbourhood was ever more generally beloved in his life or more universally lamented in his death. Chapter 1 
It is Christmas Eve, 1798. Gazing wistfully through the undulant crown glass pane of his shared black house bedroom window at the shimmering crystalline snowflakes as they drifted gently from the heavens, morphing tenderly into the silent, glistening white landscape, young George Geordie Beatty was lost in dreamy reflection of his eleventh summer in the idyllic Scottish northeast coastal paradise of St. Cyrus. As he had in recent years, during the blissful spring, summer, and the early autumn months, with his pet jackdaw perched precariously on his shoulder, George would delightedly roam and explore his treasured seaside Arcadia with its amazing abundance of flora and fauna. The mournful, majestic beauty of its volcanic rock cliffs embraced an almost secluded, perfect, and seemingly endless tawny silver sand shoreline. George detested not being able to wander and play outdoors as he had enjoyed in earlier months. His surviving siblings, Catherine and David, were too young to care, and his elder brother James, having recently turned eighteen, was helping his father William work their humble croft, which nestled cosily at the base of the Hill of Morphy, in an area known as White Hill, on the Stratton-owned Kirkside estate. Due to the infamous Highland clearances, enforced by tyrannical and avaricious landowners, many people had been evicted and forced to emigrate from their beloved homeland, whilst others, as with the Beatty family, had been pushed to small crofts in marginal areas near the ocean, or to highly elevated areas, which were less conducive to the extremely lucrative pursuit of sheep farming. The Beatty family's black house was a long, relatively narrow, single-story building with walls made of rough boulders, filled in with peat and earth for insulation. A large wooden frame of triangular trusses was placed along the top of the walls, and over the top of these was laid a combination of turf, heather, straw, and reeds, which were usually replaced annually. The thatch was secured by a fishing net weighed down at the edges with large rocks, with further rocks laid on top of the walls to give the roof extra security. There was a central hearth and no chimney, and the smoke would swirl around the roof space before escaping out of a small hole. Because the soot would blacken the inner thatch over the course of a year, as with the outer, it too was stripped off annually and used as fertilizer. As the smoke was not as thick near the ground, the family would sit on low wooden chairs called creepies around the peat fire as it gave off a significant degree of light as well as essential warmth. The fire burned day and night, ensuring the family were kept warm. The black house was unique in that it provided all-round shelter for the crofter, his family, his crops, and his livestock. The animals were housed in an earthen floor by at one end of the building, with drainage at the centre, whilst a flagged area at the other end of the house provided accommodation for the family. A part of the house, tucked up into the eaves, was also used for the storage of grain and other food. The small-scale production of crops and livestock has always been the backbone of a crofter's life. Barley, potatoes, turnips, and herbs were the most common crops, providing food for the family and winter fodder for their livestock. William Beatty had to fertilize the land heavily to provide enough soil for crops to grow. Such as in this case, Crofting areas near the sea was achieved by creating small ridges to make the soil deeper, and then piling on seaweed as fertilizer. These were called lazy beds. The number of animals that the family were permitted to keep on their croft was dictated by the amount of rent that they paid to their landlord, Joseph Stratton, the seventh laird of Kirkside. For every pound paid in rent, the crofter was allowed to keep a cow and her followers, along with several sheep. The Beatty family 
paid six pounds per annum, and thus owned a reasonable degree of livestock. Cattle were sold each year in order to pay the rent. Much of the harvest was cut by hand with heavy scythes and stacked into traditional stooks in the field to dry. Later they would be moved into the storage sections of the croft house. Afterwards the harvest grain was winnowed and threshed by hand with flails. Working the farm by hand was hard work, and due to the harshness of the landscape, output from farming was often not sufficient to support a crofter and his family. Crofters have always had to be prepared to work with the landscape. For some crofters, where timber was hard to come by, driftwood was one of the main sources, and thus any that was available was too valuable to burn. Crofters turned to the landscape to solve this problem and cut peat from the boggy moorland. The peat was cut into small blocks and then stacked up to dry. The marine environment of St. Cyrus enabled William Beatty to supplement his family's income with seasonal salmon fishing. The lifestyle of a crofter was basically part farmer, part labourer and part fisherman. As Elizabeth Scott Beatty, George's mother, laboured purposefully in the preparation of the family's traditional Christmas fare from a small adjacent dwelling, William Beatty Sr., the paternal and only surviving grandfather of George and his siblings, surreptitiously hid little gifts he'd made for the children in various nooks and crannies around the Beatty home. Infant and child mortality had a devastating impact in general, and the Beatty family were no strangers to its horrors. George's siblings, Joseph, Elizabeth, and Mary, had been tragically reclaimed from this mortal realm at profoundly tender ages. Lamentably, Joseph and Elizabeth were very young babies at death, but sweet little Mary, being significantly older when taken, was held dearest in all the hearts of the family, especially that of George. For him, in particular, she was, and would always remain, the purest expression of angelic perfection. The lost, beaty children had been laid to rest at the foot of the St. Cyrus Cliffs, in the southeast corner of the historic and fateful Old Kirkside Graveyard, adorned with a simple white wooden marker which had been lovingly carved by their grandfather William. The melancholic contentment evoked by the serenity and beauty of this kirkyard made it a site of frequent visitation by George. The snow continued to descend delicately but persistently. Much to his consternation, fearing the possibility of cold-induced illness, Elizabeth Beatty stubbornly refused to allow her son to exit the house whilst it continued. I promise I won't get cold. Please, Mama, he pleaded pathetically. Sorry, Geordie, it's not worth the risk, you know that, she answered, with her usual end-of-discussion tone. I need your help anyway. Your father and James will be coming in for their dinner shortly. Damn it, murmured George quietly under his breath. What did you just say, young man? questioned his mother, glowering daringly at him to repeat the phrase. Nothing, Mama, he grudgingly replied, head down, frowning indignantly. For William Beatty, Jr., and his son James, this would be their final Christmas as crofters, as they both had acquired positions as officers of excise in the famous coastal abbey town of Aberbrothock primarily thanks to their laird, Joseph Stratton, who possessed a great fondness for the family and was aware of their unusual degree of intelligence. The family would still remain in St. Cyrus for a further four years, until the death of William Beatty Sr. in 1802. School holidays had now become a greater pleasure and relief than ever before, due to the former parish schoolmaster, Mr. Todd, having left, and been promptly replaced by Mr. Alexander Anderson, a rabid disciplinarian. School days were far from joyful. The tall, 
round-shouldered, irascible Mr. Anderson may have been an effective teacher, but his brutish methods were all too often taken to excess. Apart from the first Monday of the year, known as Hansel Monday, merely the dropping of one slate pencil would result in an enthusiastic thrashing by cane, followed by an extensive session of kneeling on the cold stone floor. A more serious offence, such as talking, would result in a profoundly memorable punishment indeed. Sadly, it is teachers such as these who consciously choose to instil fear and gratuitously inflict humiliation and pain that engender resentment towards the educational system. Nevertheless, George gleaned all the necessary information from the process, despite its inhumane delivery. Offsetting the trials of his life, he adored entertaining his fellow man with verbal humour, mimicry, harmless practical jokes and trickery, all of which he would continue to indulge throughout his future days. Chapter 2 It is July 19th, 1802. The Beatty family now reside five miles to the south of their beloved St. Cyrus, in the historically significant seaport town of Montrose, which sits on the north bank of the estuary formed at the mouth of the South Esk by the sea, sweeping round and forming a broad basin inland behind the town. William Beatty and his eldest son James, having now been assigned to excise posts in Montrose, were thriving financially. It was now time for young George to become apprenticed. His father paid the entry fee for him to enter a trade in the mechanical profession. However, a single day was more than enough for George to know that it was not appropriate for him, as he detested every second of it. Shortly afterwards, Providence provided a placement for him in Aberdeen as a clerk in a law office. Akin to the Dickensian character of Mr. Fezziwig, George's new employer was an unusually kind, generous, and fun-loving gentleman named Jonathan Flight. Sadly, after only six weeks, Mr. Flight departed this earthly dimension due to pneumonia. George was devastated. Mr. Flight had taken a particular shine to him, and had actually altered his will to bequeath to him the substantial sum of fifty pounds. Now possessing aspirations to pursue a career in the legal profession, young George returned to a newly acquired position in Montrose as an apprentice in the office of Procurator Fiscal Mr. Colin Allison. Again, George was treated with profound kindness. When the appropriate training eventually concluded, it was time for him to complete his legal education at the Edinburgh Law School. During these revelatory years, George had studied the works of various famed radicals, such as the respected English-American philosopher, political theorist and revolutionary Thomas Paine. His intrinsic passion for fairness, truth and justice would come to the fore and permeate his entire being. He became the living embodiment of their principles. As a result, he would henceforth become stoic and absolute in his conclusions regarding the insidiousness, corruption, control, and redundancy of church, state, and monarchy. He was also a firm and true Scottish patriot. Needless to say, George obviously abhorred the concept and practice of human slavery, and held appropriately strong abolitionist views. Upon the successful completion of his legal studies, George, in his twenty-first year, returned to Montrose. The money inherited from his first employer allowed George to set up in business for himself as a legal writer or attorney. Due to his natural benevolence, compassion, generosity and amazing wit, he was a bright, shining light in Montrose society and was accepted wholeheartedly by members of every class to an equal degree. Beloved and popular souls will always bring out the worst in certain people of weak character, 
be they users, takers, or most commonly, the bitter and envious. Ultimately, George would most assuredly feel their sting. As the years passed in startling juxtaposition with George, his father and elder brother adhered to a royalist mindset. This division of viewpoints and precepts inevitably resulted in a considerable measure of estrangement between them. However, the essence of familial love remained intact regardless. When young David Beatty was old enough, he was invited by George to join his prosperous law firm, which already employed several other clerks. George held David in great esteem, love, and affection, and was more than proud to be his mentor. As fate would have it, back in St. Cyrus, his family's old friend and benefactor, the seventh laird of Kirkside, Joseph Stratton, offered George the position of factor to the Kirkside estate. Now, a factor or a state manager is a person or firm charged with operating a property for a fee when the owner is unable to personally attend to such details or is not interested in doing so. This would result in George being a frequent visitor to his treasured birthplace and landscape. George was not only the life and soul of gatherings, he was also a visually impressive figure. He had become a handsome, gentlemanly man, approximately five and a half feet tall and around fourteen stones in weight, with black curled hair, dark blue eyes, and always immaculately dressed. His ever-smiling countenance, his humour, his fun, and his endless jokes ensured he would always be surrounded by a delighted and admiring audience. George's love for elaborate, harmless, practical jokes was demonstrated on several occasions, one of them taking place on an evening in the eerie twilight, when the old church was casting its deep and gloomy shadow over the churchyard. He happened to come up the church way path, which led through the middle of it, when John Petrie, a grave and douce seceder, was strolling down to the links, wearing a broad Kilmarnock bonnet. George stooped behind a tombstone, and, as John passed, he leapt up behind him, whipped off the bonnet, and promptly vanished again. John, startled, looked round, and seeing nothing and hearing nothing, took to his heels in fright and ran like the wind. The following day, George saw his friend in the street with his Sunday bonnet on, and went down from his office to speak to him. "'You're looking great there today, John,' he proclaimed enthusiastically. "'Oh, aye, Geordie, thanks,' replied John, looking rather perturbed. "'But if this were the proper time and place for it, I'd tell you a right queer story.' He, however, still proceeded to tell him, in a low and deadly serious tone, how his bonnet had been carried off by some unearthly being as he passed through the churchyard, but had fortunately been able to escape himself. "'Well,' says George, one of my clerks was out at your council braes and found a bonnet. Wonder if it could be yours. They both went up to George's office, and to be sure, there was the identical bonnet. The question now was how the bonnet got to the council braes. George advanced a theory to account for this extraordinary circumstance. The great plague of 1666 and its victims had been buried in these sandhills, due to fears that if buried in the churchyard it could return again and reinfect the inhabitants should the graves be opened. George said that the folk who had died of the plague had gone down to see their former neighbours in the old churchyard, and had taken John's bonnet on their way past, but, being unable to carry it with them to another world, had left it above ground at the Cransel Braves where his clerk had found it. George, so well known in public life, went extensively into general society, and wherever he went a play of light humour and even of boisterous mirth circled around him. No wonder that he was the life of every company. Where he shone most was in small dinner or supper parties. There his wits sparkled with particular brilliance, and then, most of all, he delighted his friends with his humorous sallies. He had a talent few men possess 
for keeping people laughing for an entire evening at nothing. At the evening parties, it was usual to insist on every individual attending to give a toast, a sentiment, or a song. As George could not sing, he was regularly compelled to tell his story of Mark Monday. This often repeated story afforded endless delight and was told year after year in the same circle at the evening festivities held during the season of Yule. The scene of the story was set in Montrose on the day of a total eclipse, which was called Mark Monday, from it being murk or pitch dark. A number of speakers were brought in, who were well-known characters, and the humour of the story lay in George's mimicking of their voices, their tones, their attitudes, repeating their expressions, and humorously hitting off all of their peculiarities. One speaker was a Bailey, who could not grope his way down to the salt pans through the links, and said the lamps should be lighted. There were two yarn merchants, one of whom had a short cough, and the other a long one, who met and coughed and coughed and coughed, until both parties, after vain attempts to speak, shook hands to meet another day. And an adjutant in the militia, who had a funny walk, plus many others too numerous to mention. Needless to say, George bore no manner of ill will towards any of the characters in Mark Monday. They were all well known to the rest of his guests, and that gave zest to the story. George was a perfect mimic, and his talent in taking off the characters was such drollery, afforded such profound pleasure and mirth, that his friends heard the story over and over again with unwearied delight. One of the most elaborate practical jokes carried out by George and his friends became almost legendary in Montrose. On one grey autumn morning, back whilst George was still clerk to Mr. Colin Allison, the procurator fiscal, the citizens of the town awoke to discover that all the High Street lamp posts were missing their lamps. John Findlay, the town officer, was ordered to roam about banging his drum and proclaiming the offer of a reward to anyone providing information as to their whereabouts. As planned, little Annie McMurtry, the procurator fiscal's servant girl, earned the reward when she found the missing lamp stacked in a corner of the cellar when she went down to fetch coal for the office fires. On another occasion, during a performance of Macbeth, being held in Montrose's Theatre Royal, being accompanied by his friend John Tweedale, who was the landlord of the Red Lion Inn. Just upon the nerve-wracking climax of the play, George suddenly jumped to his feet and yelled, Stop! Stop! John Tweedle's scared! During the uncomfortable pregnant silence that followed, John, indignant and embarrassed, blurted out loudly, It's a damnable lie! John Tweedle is not scared, not scared. Chapter 3 It is November the 11th, 1815. George is now in his twenty-ninth year. Having an ever-growing passion for the written word, George was a regular contributor to the local newspaper, the Montrose Review. In this month, he completed the first draft of an epic poem based on the deluded boasts and rants of a boorish Montrose town officer named John Findlay of Arnhall. This work was an homage to the celebrated Ayrshire bard Robert Burns, who was first cousin to George's best friend and confederate James Burness Esquire. Life at this time was extremely social, Citizens would habitually gather in groups throughout the streets to discuss events of the day and things in general. With its broad, roomy high street, Montrose was ideal for this purpose. Although George was noted for his social qualities, he was simple in his habits and extremely temperate, a thing unusual at this time. As in the case of every man who is decidedly individual, his personal appearance was in perfect harmony with his character. With his ever-smiling countenance, his warm-heartedness and good humour literally shone from his eyes. Besides his habitual wit and drollery, he was a humorist in the proper sense. 
There are two types of humorist, the broad sarcastic and the low comic. The former has keen insight into character, great breadth of view, and a clear perception of the moral weaknesses and follies of mankind. His power lies in irony, sarcasm, and satire, and sometimes in dry humour. George wrote a number of satires which were extremely deserved, focused and profoundly acerbic in nature and observation. In him, the creative does not lie primarily in the region of thought, but more so in that of imagination and feeling. The use of occasional halting, spondaic and trochaic lines in the middle of regular iambics is a marked characteristic of his muse. We can conceive that his winning smile and kindly disposition would gain him many friends, but there was something deeper which endeared him to the people, always being quoted along with his name. As a lawyer, the poor and oppressed found in him a kind and sympathizing friend. He achieved redress for their wrongs, and furnished them with legal advice, for which services he would take no payment or reward. His conduct in this respect had obviously made a great impression on the people, as it was so frequently alluded to. It would form a striking contrast to the behaviour of far too many of his professional brethren. The law firm which George had begun, now assisted by his younger brother David and several clerks, was situated on the first floor of a building in the high street of Montrose, at the east side, not far from the church and town hall. He and the family initially lived in a substantial dwelling to the left of the office, before relocating to a relatively large house in a nearby area called New Wind, close to the Star Inn Tavern. As a boy, George had always loved having a pet, and as an adult, he was no different. At this time he possessed a beloved green parrot, called Katie, which he, for the most part, kept in his office. He would sit Katie's cage on the window ledge, allowing her fresh air, and to observe the townspeople as they engaged in their daily pursuits. To all who knew him, George's friendship was generous, warm, and sincere. Few had so large a share of early happiness as he. None of the outward elements were wanting. Nature wore for him unfading charms. He loved to visit every romantic spot, and there, in the sweet musings of contemplation, to hold converse with the unseen. He lived amid a circle of warm friends, and had the consciousness of being universally liked and respected. After all, it is this communion which constitutes the chief ingredient in the cup of human happiness. Fine scenery, mystic woods, and ivy-mantled ruins count for much. But this world and all that is in it would be naught without the friendship of man. Such were the outward elements of good which he possessed. Of the inner, he had even more. In him, the spontaneities of happiness were extraordinary. The common things of life gave him a more exalted pleasure than they do to others, because he had a higher sensibility. This keener sensibility, however, if it confers a greater happiness, necessarily carries with it a capability of greater misery, which will develop under certain negative conditions. Chapter 4 It is February the 14th, 1820. George the Fourth has now reigned as monarch for sixteen days since the death of his father on January 29th. Sir Joseph Muter Stratton is the current owner of the Kirkside estate in St. Cyrus after inheriting it from his unmarried uncle in 1816. Formerly known as Sir Joseph Muter, he is the younger son of William Muter of Anfield in Fifeshire, and Janet Ney Stratton of Kirkside in Kincardenshire. In order to legally inherit his late uncle's title and property, he had to adopt his mother's maiden name of Stratton. Muter joined the British Army as a cornet, originally the third and lowest grade of commissioned officer in a British cavalry troop, after captain and lieutenant, 
in the Second Dragoon Guards in December 1794. On September 5, 1801, he was promoted from captain to major by purchase in the 13th Light Dragoons. Then, on May 6, 1808, he transferred in the same rank to the 23rd Light Dragoons. He later saw service in the Peninsular War with the 13th Light Dragoons and was present at the battles of Campo Mea, Albura, Uzagri, Arroyo Molinos, Arroyo de Melinos, and Alba de Tormes. At the Battle of Waterloo, and by then a lieutenant colonel, Muta commanded the 6th Inniskilling, or Irish Regiment of Dragoons. During the battle, in response to the French infantry assault on Wellington's left centre, the Union Brigade moved forward. Unobserved until late in their advance, they caught the French by surprise and took around 1,000 prisoners, despite the two British heavy cavalry brigades losing half their numbers at the hands of the French lancers and cuirassiers. Following the death of Major General Sir William Ponsonby, command of the 2nd Union Cavalry Brigade devolved upon Muta. At around 6 p.m., after Le Hay's Saint Farm had fallen to the French, Muta was struck by a musket ball in the right wrist. The injury quickly became badly infected due to pieces of glove, although he subsequently recovered without the need for amputation. It may be noted that he was succeeded by Clifton of the Royals, who, oddly enough, followed him in the colonelcy of the 17th Lancers. The command of the regiment, such as it remained, was with a Major Philip Dorville. After Waterloo, Sir Joseph was awarded the Russian Order of St. Vladimir and served in Ireland in 1819. In the absence of Sir Joseph, George continued to fulfil his duties as factor to the Kirkside estate. Membership of the long-established radical institution known as the Montrose Club was inevitable for George. Five of his closest friends, also members, were Provost Charles Barclay, James Burness, Esquire, Dr. Gibson, Alex Thompson, and Mr. James Bissett. On occasional Sundays, when the weather permitted, this band of brothers would make their way to a picturesque spot they favoured called the Den of Ananias in the nearby parish of Meryton. Here, the friends would relax and discuss their mutual disdain for the establishment in general. All were of the same mind, being determined to see social reform become a reality. George was closest to James Burness, who was first cousin to the heir Shabard, Robert Burns. He was six years George's senior, and also practised law in Montrose. Already a Dean of Guild, which means under Scots law, he was one of a group of borough magistrates who had the care of buildings. On September 23, 1818, he was elected provost. On April 13th of that same year, he had proudly announced to the Montrose Town Council that at a public meeting the Guildry had unanimously declared that they had heard with satisfaction that Joseph Hume, Esquire, a Guild brother of the borough, had, at the invitation of his townsmen, offered himself a candidate to represent the district of boroughs in the next Parliament, and, taking into account the well-known talents, principles, and conduct of that gentleman for years past, they thought him a proper person to be their representative in Parliament, and therefore recommended him to the magistrates and town council for their votes on the occasion. Joseph Hume was the younger son of a shipmaster in Montrose, a Scottish radical politician, surgeon, scholar, and aspiring reformer whose agenda and ideals were profoundly supported by George and his confederates. Prior to entering into politics, Joseph, born January 22, 1777, was apprenticed to a local surgeon. After three years, he was sent to study medicine successively at Aberdeen, Edinburgh and London, and in 1796 became a member of the College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and on February the 2nd of the following year, an assistant surgeon in the sea service of the East India Company. 
This post was obtained for him by the influence of David Scott of Donindold, Forfarshire, director of the East India Company and MP for Forfar. He made his first voyage out in 1797, became a full assistant surgeon on November 12, 1799, and was posted to the ship Horton. On the voyage out, he discharged satisfactorily the duties of the purser who died. He was then transferred to the land service of the company and devoted himself zealously to the study of the native languages and religions. Having rapidly mastered Hindustani and Persian, he was employed by the administration in political duties. In 1801, he joined the army at Bundelkund on the eve of the Maratha War as surgeon to the 18th Sepoy Regiment and was at once appointed interpreter to Lieutenant Colonel Powell, commanding one of the forces. In 1802, he rendered the government an important service by devising a safe means of drying the stock of gunpowder, which was found to have become damp. During the war, he filled several high posts in the offices of the paymaster of the forces, the prize agency office, and the commissariat, and at its conclusion was publicly thanked by Lord Lake. His opportunities of enriching himself had not been neglected, and in 1807 he was able to return to Bengal with £40,000 and to quit the service. He landed in England in 1808 and spent some years in travel and study. He visited the whole of the United Kingdom in 1809, more especially the manufacturing towns, and travelled during 1810 and 1811 in the Mediterranean and in Egypt. In the same year, he began a political career at home. On the death of Sir John Lothar Johnston, he was returned in January of 1812 to Weymouth, having purchased two elections to the seat. But when, upon the dissolution in the autumn of 1812, the owners of the borough refused to re-elect him, he took proceedings for the recovery of his money and succeeded in getting a portion returned. Before re-entering Parliament, Hume took an active part upon the Central Committee of the Lancastrian School System and studied the condition of the working classes, publishing a pamphlet on savings banks. He also devoted great attention to Indian affairs and tried strenuously but without success to obtain election to the directorate of the East India Company. He was indefatigable at proprietors' meetings in exposing abuses and published some of his speeches at the Court of Proprietors. He re-entered Parliament under Liberal auspices in 1818 as member for the Border Boroughs, joining the opposition in 1819. He was re-elected for the same constituency in 1820. Chapter 5 It is January the 5th, 1821. George is in his 35th year. History, in her ample pages, has enrolled the names of many lovers, of whom poets have sung, and whose story has impassioned the hearts of the youthful and the feeling. Yet none of these records has the romantic interest or the fascinating power and intensity of the story of George Beatty. Time, like the evening, softens all the tints and mellows all the colours, and the twilight in which the past is seen wraps all the events of history in obscurity, and the well-known and familiar, as the story of human affection must ever be, gains an enchantment by being dimly seen across the bourne which parts us from the unknown and the long-forgotten. Once again, snow has transformed the streets of Montrose, and moonlight reflection illuminates the darkness. Just outside Adam McPherson's tavern, just opposite the Star Stables in New Wind, George met one of his more recent acquaintances, named Squire Robert Gibson, whom, having refreshed himself effectively with a large glass of whiskey punch and two pints of nappy ale, was more than merry. A happy new year to you, George, proclaimed Squire Gibson, enthusiastically, but with slightly slurred speech. You, you really must come up to the house one evening soon, George. You've never met my wife, Isabel, and my daughter, William, have you? 
"'Indeed not, sir. I've not yet had that pleasure,' replied George, somewhat concerned that this invitation was offered merely through the influence of alcohol. "'You're probably wondering why we named a girl William. <laughs> I'm guessing, eh? Am I right, George?' Squire Gibson mumbled almost incoherently. "'Well, uh, yes, uh, possibly. A uh, little curious, I suppose.' George answered cautiously. "'Her uncle, you see. My wife's brother, William, in Grenada. Her uncle, you see. My wife's brother, William, in Grenada. Her pots of cash. <laughs> we thought the baby was going to be a boy, for some reason. Anyway, we'd intended to name it after him, hoping he'd look upon us generously in his will. Uh, rather embarrassing, actually. Uh, I mean, for her, uh, especially having to live with a boy's name and all that. Uh, still, hmm, what's done, etc., 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 he explained, his voice trailing off bemusedly. Anyway, George, Friday today, uh, how would this Sunday suit you? Uh, about 4 p.m.? Uh, yes, yes, excellent, sir, excellent. Uh, thank you most sincerely. Uh, I look forward to it, replied George still harbouring an element of uncertainty. Squire Robert Gibson was a gentleman farmer who lived with his family in a mansion house which stood near a large megalithic monolith known as the Stone of Morphy. The house was referred to by this title. Ironically, this area is not far from George's birthplace at Hill of Morphy in St. Cyrus. George, being a natural scholar, and a student of history, whether general or local, must have been aware that the Gibson family, as with so many other North East Scots gentry, had surely derived the majority of their finances in some way from proceeds gleaned from Caribbean plantation slavery. However, in this instance, he demonstrated an extreme degree of cognitive dissonance. Upon his visit, George was graciously welcomed by Squire Robert whom immediately introduced him to his wife and youngest daughter. For George, it was love at his first sight of Miss William Gibson. Miss Gibson was tall, sprightly, and dashing, fascinating rather than beautiful, with light brown hair and hazel eyes. She had entered her twenty-third year in the previous autumn. Through regular visits to the Stone of Morphy household, George and Miss Gibson had developed an ever-growing friendship, and by August of that same year he considered himself warranted in paying his addresses to her, and though they were nominally rejected, he was strictly enjoined by her not to cease or lessen his visits. It soon appeared that Miss Gibson's refusal was not sincere. Their intimacy continued to grow till the spring of 1822. This was the blooming season of the year, when summer first unfolds her robes, when the woods resound with the songs of the singing birds, and the primrose, with all the other plants of early summer, are in bloom. The lovers spent many happy hours wandering in the gloaming among the woods of Canaba. This spot is three miles from Montrose on the south bank of the North Esk River near the ocean. Leaving the town by the highway going north, you pass the woods of Charlton on the left side, while on the right a series of woods and sandy downs stretch to the sea. Between the second and third milestones, the woods of Canaba come into sight, away down to the right. A mansion known as the House of Canaba at this time was owned by the Gibson family, but whilst renovations were being carried out, it remained as yet uninhabited. Miss Gibson, coming from Stone of Morphy, would walk a mile down the other side of the North Esk, cross by the bridge, and meet her lover in the garden. For a considerable part of this summer, the lovers met at least twice a week at the House of Canaba. This is a plain white house, originally built in 1680, which at this time could barely be seen from the highway for thickly growing trees. The garden is surrounded by a wall and is full of bushes and of fruit trees, some of which were grown to a great size and extremely old. This was their favourite haunt. 
Many were the vows of fidelity and solemn promises which passed between them. In certain points of character there was a wonderful contrast between them. She was proud, aspiring in her ideas and ambitious. He was unreserved, affable, and much more humble. At first sight, it is surprising there should be so strong an affinity between natures so different, but when there is a strong common sympathy, and each is weak where the other is strong, there is a leaning on both sides, and these differences are sources of true attachment, since in them lies the secret of mutual dependence. Often did they discuss the points of differences in their character. A hundred times told did they conclude that their union would be the beginning of a lifelong happiness, and that nothing but death would part them. They gilded the future with beautiful imaginations, and one would have thought that a love so hallowed, so pure and devoted, would have lasted for ever. It was strong on both sides. Miss Gibson was much more demonstrative, as well as more sensitive and jealous, whilst George's love was deeper and more serious. Their relationship continued, and their friendship increased the following summer of 1822 till the spring of 1823. Throughout this time, the couple kept in regular contact via letters and notes using pseudonyms to preserve their privacy, being either posted or delivered by the hands of servants. George visited often at Stone of Morphy, and whenever Miss Gibson was in town, they arranged to walk out together. As an example of their vows of fidelity, George, on one memorable occasion, had called at Stone of Morphy, and when they were alone, she complained that he had been jaunting without her. George explained that it was not on pleasure but business, and that the weather had been disagreeable. On his rising to leave, Miss Gibson positioned herself between him and the door, and urged that they both must repeat their vows. She then laid her hands in his, and proposed they both repeat a solemn oath. He said that he had no objections whatsoever, but to bear in mind that it bound them whether her parents might be agreeable or not. She insisted that her parents were most definitely agreeable, and emphatically stated that she had already informed them of their engagement, and that they had expected no less. "'Go on then, my love. Just tell me what you wish me to say,' said George, compassionately. "'Please repeat after me these words,' she said solemnly with her eyes fixed firmly on his. May I never know peace in this world, or see God in mercy, if I marry another than you, or if I ever go south again without taking you along with me as my wife. George repeated exactly as requested, and then Miss Gibson took a similar oath herself. This was perhaps the most marked of their oft-repeated vows on former occasions. Whatever may be thought of the propriety of taking such oaths, it is certainly a dreadful crime to break them, ratified as they are with such a sanction. Chapter 6 It is May 1st, 1823. The Gibson family received accounts of the death of William Mitchell, the uncle and namesake of Miss Gibson, and brother to her mother, Isabel. He had succumbed to malaria at fifty-seven years of age. He gained considerable wealth in Grenada, which is an island country consisting of Grenada itself and six smaller islands at the southern end of the Grenadines in the southeastern Caribbean Sea. It is located northwest of Trinidad and Tobago, northeast of Venezuela, and southwest of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Apparently, he bequeathed a large portion of it to his close relatives in Scotland. Reluctantly, Robert Gibson had formally agreed at the behest of his formidable wife to promulgate the story that William Mitchell held the prestigious post of Governor of Grenada, which is a gubernatorial official appointed by king or other monarch. He was also purported to be an honourable, loving, and generous man. The truth, however, was vastly different. William Mitchell Esquire 
was in fact the owner and agent of the Mount Nesbitt sugar plantation in St. John. He held ownership of over 100 black slaves. Needless to say, William Mitchell was at no time a governor of anything other than that of human misery, bondage and exploitation. Most of the wealth accumulated by the British landed gentry had been garnered not simply through tenant rent, but primarily through Caribbean plantation slavery, illegal trade, and smuggling. Dishonorable conduct and corruption are frequently, if not exclusively, the means by which great wealth is amassed. This particular case was to be no exception. In the written communications between Miss Gibson and George, Miss Gibson had adopted the pseudonym of Sarah Brunka, the name of her uncle's black housekeeper, or so she possibly thought, and most definitely led George to believe. Sarah Brunka was in fact no housekeeper, but rather a slave-owning quadroon woman of independent wealth. She and William Mitchell shared an intimate relationship, which led to the birth of an octoroon daughter whom they named Hannah. William Mitchell had indeed initially bequeathed a huge sum of money to his relatives in Scotland, as well as naming his niece, Miss Gibson, as residuary legatee. But this will did not reflect his financial status at the time of death, nor was it the only one which existed. An unregistered and unwitnessed updated version was found by Sarah Brunka. There had also been some West India property, his plantation was mired in debt, to the extent that he had been forced to borrow three thousand pounds from Sarah Brunker. On Sunday, May 4th, George visited Stone of Morphy. Although Miss Gibson was currently aware of her apparently enhanced financial wealth, George apprehended no change in her affections, and in this he was not mistaken. Old matters were talked over, and all their pledges and vows renewed. Miss Gibson declared that the fortune she had become possessed of could not alter her feelings, but, on the contrary, made them more lasting. Their conversation culminated with George offering to give Miss Gibson a little time to reflect on her change in circumstances, and perhaps reassess her affections for him. She indignantly replied, "'Nothing has changed. I wish no time. I am yours for ever.' Thus, once more, did these lovers interchange vows of unalterable fidelity, in spite of her fortune. Later that same evening, George and the Gibson family had adjourned to the parlour after dining. Whilst nursing a curiously excessive glass of brandy, George graciously declined a cigar offered by his host. It would very quickly become obvious that an agenda was about to unfold. As Robert Gibson strangely began staring sheepishly at the floor, his wife Isabel glared intently at him, as if to urge the raising of some particular topic. Following a peculiarly strained interlude, Robert briefed glancely uneasily at his wife before laying his cards on the table. He opened first, acknowledging he and his wife's awareness of the existing engagement between George and his daughter, and professed great delight at the prospect of having George as a future son-in-law. He then suggested that in light of him soon becoming part of the family, that he should hold no objection to being of assistance in aiding his new family in possibly resolving a pressing and important issue. George listened intently, albeit apprehensively, to what was being said. Robert momentarily hesitated before leaning forward, and at last declaring his request. Basically, George was asked to acquire, in his official capacity as a trained legal writer and solicitor, a copy of William Mitchell's will, duplicate it somewhat, but have it dated just prior to William's date of death, and, most importantly, exclusively favouring his Scottish kin. Utterly baffled and bewildered by this request, George, becoming increasingly offended at this obvious attempt to exploit him, categorically but nevertheless politely, declined to participate in anything even remotely unprofessional in nature. Apologies were made, and the topic of conversation quickly changed. Isabel Gibson furtively exited the scene. Believing all to be well, 
George left about nine o'clock that evening. Unbeknown to him at this time, the die is cast, and his fate is now sealed. On the following day, profoundly influenced and cajoled by her mother, Miss Gibson wrote to George, informing him of her change of heart and requesting an immediate end to their engagement and relationship. Callously and unjustly, alluding to the notion of she and her family's concern that her fortune may hold too great a charm for him. In what extraordinary light does this show the human heart? Yesterday the sincere and devoted lover now resolved to cast her oaths and vows to the winds. Only a woman with the heart of a serpent could write such a thing to a man like George Beatty, knowing absolutely that the mere insinuation of him being after her money was not only ludicrously cruel and untrue, but would cut him to the core of his very being. None knew better than she that his guileless, unmaterialistic simplicity was incapable of such a thing. This tactic was undoubtedly intended to gall him into giving her up. It was also made clear that she wished the return of all the letters she had sent to him, her manoeuvres even stooping to emotional blackmail by referring to his honour as a gentleman. Soon after this he saw Miss Gibson and unfathomably all the unpleasantness which had occurred was buried in oblivion. Miss Gibson claimed that she made the request merely to test him, and laughed at the idea of his having taken the matter seriously. She also said that she wanted a document from him on the subject of their engagement, and that his two last letters were quite sufficient and bound him completely. She then voluntarily took a most solemn oath that she would punctually and faithfully fulfil her engagements with him, and never think of retracting while she drew breath. Miss Gibson then said she wished to reside a short time at the house of Keneva, which she had newly come to, and that as soon as arrangements could afterwards be made, their union would take place. It is almost incomprehensible from what motive she now acted, as she was also now courting the addresses of another man, whom had previously never shown the slightest interest in her. The greatest likelihood was that this entire charade was simply yet another manoeuvre to regain her letters. The man who began to pay marked attention to Miss Gibson, now that her fortune had become notorious, was William Smart of Cairnbank, a partner with his brother George Smart as a firm of grain merchants. He was a somewhat handsome man, but a foppish, conceited fool, whose ends were merely mercenary. In truth, he cared nothing for her herself, only for her money. Miss Gibson welcomed his attentions, and it soon became evident that her last solemn oath and her engagements with George at their reconciliation were all a lie. Yet there was some curious acting on that occasion. After some conversation had taken place between them, she asked George why he was looking so ill. He made no immediate answer, but eventually confessed that he had been greatly affected by her recent actions. She actually looked rather poorly herself. Miss Gibson suddenly burst into tears, and said she never could forgive herself for having latterly acted towards him the way she had done. She then promised to meet him soon. After all this, only two days had elapsed, when she set off for Edinburgh without informing George, and it was now evident she now shunned him. While she was there with her father, George wrote out a statement of facts in regard to the entire connection between Miss Gibson and himself, and sent it to Squire Gibson. Despite having written it in despair, he truly felt he had done nothing improper, as Robert Gibson was his close friend. Miss Gibson took the statement from her father and destroyed it. Upon returning home, she wrote extremely offensive and cruel letters to George in retaliation for this perceived threat. A short while after this, she went to Pitcairthley, which was famous in Scotland for its five mineral springs. William Smart was one of the party. On Tuesday, July 29th, 
Mr. George Neal of Borrowfield, who was also a close friend of George, and married to Helen Gibson, who was Miss Gibson's half-sister, called on George with a view to securing Miss Gibson's letters. George graciously, but adamantly, declined to surrender them, and was not at all impressed that the Gibson family had forced George Neal to accept this errand by exploiting he and George's long-standing friendship. He thought of seeking legal redress, and perhaps the only fault which is attachable to him is saying he would. Although hugely entitled to, and guaranteed of success, that he was utterly incapable of seeking or of accepting money damages is evident from his known character. George even found it unthinkable just getting a decision recorded in a court of law against the perjury of which he had been made the object where the sole punishment would be exposure. He was driven to the idea of seeking such a redress by the insults offered to him on the part of the Gibsons and by the vulgar triumph of his rival. The thing, however, was never done, and never attempted. Chapter 7 It is August the 11th, 1823. The summer was hastening to a close. It was early May when nature had put on her mantle of living green that the first rude shock awoke him from his dreams of happiness, and he felt the first pangs of a broken heart. The trees which had budded and blossomed now hung with ripe fruit. The birds had sung their sweet songs and fledged their tender brood, and now were gathered to wing their way to sunnier climes. The wild flowers bloomed and faded, the golden harvest was reaped from the fields, but all had been unheeded by this true lover of nature. Peace had fled from his once happy mind and he was too much absorbed with his own misery to heed the changes in the face of nature. It had now become notorious that Miss Gibson had abandoned him, and was to be married to another. Weighed down by crippling grief and crushed by despair, George, on Friday, August 8th, executed a will, and afraid he could not survive Miss Gibson's wedding day, and apprehensive that his will would not hold good unless he lived sixty days after making it, he sent a letter to Miss Gibson, asking that her forthcoming nuptials be postponed for a short time. The letter was answered in the negative by her father, who appeared to exhibit no indignation at the perfidy of his daughter. Nevertheless, Robert Gibson may have appeared callous and heartless, but he was the least guilty of the family. He had always liked George, and would not have done anything against him. In a way, he could also be regarded as a victim, as he too was at the mercy of his second and current wife, Isabel. It was Isabel Gibson who instigated and abetted her daughter to discard George. She was no better than a Medici tyrant who held a grudge against George, for not complying with the request to aid in her corrupt agenda. She was also acutely aware that George could now expose her criminal intentions, should he ever choose to do so. William Smart had been socially known to the Gibsons for quite a while. He and his brother George had purchased the Kenbank estate near Brieken in 1821. They were a cold and calculating pair of opportunists who, as with most of the upper class, were willing to do anything to obtain or maintain social position, power, and wealth. Again, it was Isabel Gibson who convinced William Smart to enter the picture, with assurances of financial gain, regardless of her being aware that he would never love her daughter in the slightest. The Smarts and Mrs. Gibson were cut from the same cloth and were adept in manipulation and deception. A vehement campaign of harassment against George was now embarked upon. Not content with trampling on all her solemn engagements and oaths, Miss Gibson made public George's last appeal, and held it up to ridicule and mockery. George sat in his parlour, with his head resting in his hands. This is the picture of a man whose heart is torn with jealousy,
and devastated with insult. Those places, people, and pursuits which had once brought him such happiness were now devoid of all effect. Dark shadows obliterated his every thought. Being deeply ashamed that he could have been dragged to such depths by circumstances so ignoble in nature, combined with reluctance to burden others with his troubles, he would not seek solace or support through confiding the details of his heartbreak to any of his close family or friends. Everyone may have known the general outline of what had been perpetrated against him, but his exhausting efforts to disguise his pain were sufficiently successful. In his chaotic and tormented state of mind, George took a coach to Aberdeen in order to purchase a flintlock pistol. Whether to use on himself or William Smart, he had not yet decided. On Saturday, September 20th, he left in the morning and returned at night. His going so far was evidently to avoid attracting notice. The following day, with the newly acquired pistol carefully hidden, he walked his usual route to St. Cyrus. There arriving, he began testing the weapon on the south wall of the old nether kirkyard. Being dissatisfied with its performance, he concluded he must replace it and resigned himself to a repeated journey. His contemplation of suicide now gave way to serious alternate intent. That evening of Friday, September 26th, aware that William Smart was attending on Montrose Council meeting, he waited in the lodge here beneath the townhouse, which ironically was the setting for the famed fight scene in George's epic poem, John O'Arna. Upon his eventual departure from the building, George calmly confronted him and assertively demanded a private meeting alone, somewhere devoid of prying eyes and ears. Strangely, Smart readily agreed, simply asking George where and when. The first place which sprang into George's mind was, of course, the old nether kirkyard at St. Cyrus. Three o'clock at the old kirkyard on Monday, September 29th, was promptly arranged. The weekend passed so slowly that it felt like an eternity to George. On the Sunday evening, he sat by the fire in the parlour of his home with his mother, Elizabeth, and his two younger siblings, David and Catherine. His father, William, and elder brother James only returned home every third weekend, as they were still employed as excise officers at the Perthshire-based Ruth Venn Printfield Company, where they had been assigned to thirteen years previously. The atmosphere was, under the circumstances, peculiarly peaceful, and as the evening drew to a close, he rose from his armchair, wished everyone a good night, gently kissed his mother and sister, ruffled his young brother's hair, and serenely retired to bed. Since the middle of August, George had been writing with the utmost clarity astonishing disclosures concerning the state of his mind, which he had entitled The Last, so that whatever occurred, a detailed record would exist. He had finished it earlier that afternoon. He had thought he was finished several times before, but restarted again, causing repetitions which reflected the erratic nature of his thoughts and emotions. In George's usual fashion, the sheets on which he had written it were folded up, like lawyer's papers, with the title on the blank outside page. Due primarily to his will still requiring a further eight days before becoming legal, George knew that its meticulously detailed contents were vital to the future security of his young siblings. His relationship with his elder brother had deteriorated beyond repair, caused mainly through their political and religious beliefs. However, without a legally binding will, as the eldest, James would be the sole beneficiary. George had no idea what the following day would hold, but for the time being, at least suicide was no longer his imminent and solitary intention. He awoke long before the sunrise, which he especially wished to witness. George was immaculately groomed and dressed when he came down for breakfast. Later that morning, approaching noon, 
Catherine asked George if what she had planned for dinner that evening would be appealing to him. No, thanks, Kate. Uh, not for me. I'm off to the country and may not be back till late. I'll get something myself if I come. If I come. This response concerned her. The brother she had known all her life had changed so much. His bumpily personality and cheery disposition had gone. When ready to leave, with his pistol concealed under his coat, he again softly kissed his mother and sister on the cheek, smiled warmly at his brother, and walked down the hall to the door. When he opened it, he gazed at the sky and said, "'Looks like it may rain.' Then he left. A dreadful feeling of impending catastrophe descended over the household. As he stepped into the high street, the children were happily playing and the busy hum of city life went on as usual. He had three hours until his rendezvous with William Smart, so before beginning his journey to St. Cyrus, he went down to the links, made general conversation with various people, and ate a couple of apples while sitting outside James Duke's Heckle House, which is a place where flax was teased and combed out. A shipload of apples had just come in, as it was the end of September. Just over an hour later, he then went along the links, northwards from Montrose, towards the woods of Charlton, on his way to the old nether kirkyard. He unhurriedly wended his way towards the scenes of his childhood, and the lonely, silent, melancholic place in the kirkyard where, on Saturday afternoons, he would sit on the grass, leaning against the short, thick stone wall next to the spot where his departed young siblings were laid to rest. By this road he had often gone before in far different moods, when he accompanied a friend on an evening walk, or went to the meeting-places in the woods and the garden of Kinneber, or when he walked alone to enjoy in sweet musings the beauties of nature. But now a gloom darker than midnight overshadowed his soul. As he walked over the lonely sward leading to the dark pine wood of Charlton, the sea is hidden from his sight by the range of sand hills, but the cliffs at St. Cyrus beyond the North Esk, his boyhood paradise, are in sight the whole way. The skies now gloomed as the sun struggled to shine through the darkening clouds. The last ears of the harvest had now been reaped, the fields were empty and bare, and the leaves were falling from the trees. Nothing now yielded him the sympathy for which he craved. Leaving the links, he proceeded along the high road, and crossing the North Esk by the bridge, hastened towards the braes of St. Cyrus. The scenes of youth have for everyone an inexpressible charm. Nature is then responsive, and everything reflects our ardent feelings. Even when we come to see that the charm lay not in them, but was the projection from our own minds, they retain their place in our sympathies on account of the feelings they recall by early associations. Here, among those sunny braes by the sea, George had spent the happiest days of his youth. From his childhood's home he had gone out into the world and commenced the struggle of life. He had risen from a comparatively humble origin to a position of influence and honourable independence. He had done something as a poet to make his name remembered. Many warm friends had he gained, while the poor and downtrodden blessed him as a kind benefactor. Within the last two years he had formed an attachment which wielded over him a malignant spell, and now, after a summer of such humiliations and such anguish as were more than his wounded spirit could bear, he returned desolate and alone to the home of childhood. The thought of all these things crowded in upon his mind. The vista through the valley of life, when he first started on its path, had been lit up with the rays of hope, and everything as he went on enchanted him with its novelty. He had now come to a point where he saw the same things, in reverse. He had gone through almost every experience which a mere earthly life can give. The charm of novelty had fled. Those 
gilded imaginings of the future, like the memories of the past, were now tinged with despair. It seemed to him but a moment since he was here as a boy. The many events of those past years had now faded from its view. He had returned, as it were, to the beginning of the race, and found himself at the point from which he had started. Was all this the price of an unusually happy childhood, where he whiled away the long summer days, sporting among the braes, or was it because he'd risen to fame and honour? The blasting of his hopes, and the treachery of which he had been made the object, with all the complications, had brought on a struggle which threw him back on his last resources. What a man lives by, and lives for, involves his very manhood. As the old nether kirkyard came into view, George briefly grasped the handle of the pistol hidden beneath his coat. At first he could see no one. As he approached the kirkyard stile, his eyes darted from side to side as he scanned the area. He still saw nothing. George removed the pocket watch from his waistcoat and checked the time. It was just past three o'clock. His heart was beating ever more rapidly as he spun around to see in every direction when he heard a voice call out his name. It came from inside the Kirkyard Watchhouse. Most communities near the Scottish schools of medicine in Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Aberdeen employed some means of protecting the dead, such as a watchhouse for the relatives of the deceased to keep vigil, which was built into the northeast corner of the Kirkyard, forming part of its walled enclosure. As its door opened, from out of the darkness within the watchhouse slowly emerged William Smart. He held up his hand in an oddly beckoning gesture. As George climbed and crossed the stile, he felt himself engulfed in an air of sinister apprehension. William Smart hovered, barely visible, in the doorway, whilst George proceeded cautiously towards him, keeping close to the wall. Nearing the little stone watchhouse, George paused, as Smart now began slightly advancing. "'I really didn't think you'd come,' stated George, with caustic tone. Oh, "'Why would I not, Geordie, old chap?' answered Smart arrogantly, wearing his quintessential condescending smirk. "'What is it I may do for you this fine day?' Your permanent emigration to the colonies would suffice nicely, Billy, old boy, George replied with matching contempt. Studying George carefully, Smart's demeanour suddenly changed. Geordie, George, let's be civilised about this. We've no need to be enemies, no need whatsoever. The Gibsons and I merely have a business arrangement. That's all, business, just business. Smart stated placidly, "'Come, George, please, walk with me for a moment.' Somewhat taken aback by his sudden altered attitude, George bewilderedly acquiesced to his request. With an ushering arm extended, William Smart motioned forward. Seconds after George turned away from the watchhouse, he was struck violently across the back of his head and fell forward, completely unconscious. Smart had been accompanied by two hired thugs, who had obviously been laying in wait amidst the darkly shadowed interior of the watchhouse. With Kosh still in hand, and assisted by his equally vile partner, George was roughly carried towards the stile at the southeast corner. Because Miss Gibson had previously described as Smart, how and where George regularly sat whilst visiting the grave of his siblings, he had already decided exactly what was to happen next. Upon reaching the intended spot, George was set down in the exact position he would normally have sat, with his back against the wall and his head resting in a perfectly shaped and naturally formed little niche. Verbally guided by Smart, they carefully arranged his body with appropriate detail in accordance with the specifics of their plan. The pistol carried by George was discovered and promptly seized. They had brought pistols of their own, but this one was ideal. 
George's hat was placed back on his head, his pistol already loaded, was moulded correctly into his right hand, the muzzle then placed inside his mouth, and the trigger pulled. The killer's coat sleeve had slightly ignited on fire through having partially obstructed the gunpowder flash. It now truly looked like a suicide. The final touch was the placement of a professionally forged but poorly worded suicide note, which contained fine details and knowingly furnished by Miss Gibson through interrogative conversations she'd had with her odious Machiavellian mother. Samples of George's handwriting had been easily acquired by William Smart, and being no stranger to the criminal fraternity, knew exactly the right individual to whom he should assign the task. With his hat now crushed over his eyes, a loosened gaiter and a large pool of blood forming in his lap, George Beatty was dead. Even the initial wound on the back of his head had been conveniently obliterated. William Smart and his mercenary hirelings stealthily fled the scene of their monstrous crime in a carriage which had been calculatedly concealed in a nearby secluded grove. As evening fell, the darkness towards the northeast was something more than common. The clouds gathered over St. Cyrus until the rain began pouring down in torrents while the east wind was wuthering round the trees and tombstones. George's lifeless body was almost lovingly sheltered to a great extent by the kirkyard wall. William Reith was herd boy of his father's cattle that season, and whilst putting them in the adjacent pasture, at noon the following day, Tuesday the 30th, saw the body, whom he took for the local minister, Reverend Alexander Keith, lying apparently asleep. Believing it to be the minister, he took no further notice at the time, but on returning to let out his cattle at about two o'clock that afternoon, he saw that the body of this person was still lying in the same position. He then went to examine the matter more carefully, and was horrified in looking over the kirkyard wall to see a large pool of coagulated blood lying in the lap. The pistol lay with its muzzle resting on George's lip, and the thumb of his right hand was close to the trigger. His face was not touched in the slightest degree by the powder. The boy ran home and told his father, who, along with others, hastened to the kirkyard, but by the time they got down, a number of salmon fishes, who had been taking a stroll in their dinner hour, were already there, and had already discovered George's body. The first of the squad of fishers who discovered it was William Balfour, who had been for many years the respected blacksmith and veterinary surgeon at Bruce Mill. The mournful intelligence of George's death was communicated to his family by his friend, the Reverend Dr. Keith of St. Cyrus. His family and friends were naturally devastated in the extreme. The body had been transported to Montrose for examination at the local morgue. Nothing unusual was discovered, and the death was recorded as self-inflicted. Under the general circumstances, the verdict of suicide remained primarily unchallenged. Thus, William Smart and Isabel Gibson had successfully removed their problem and gotten away with murder. The people of the town, who had loved him in life, knew better. The untimely death of George Beatty awakened the most intense feelings in St. Cyrus and Montrose. It was a mingled feeling of pity for his fate and stifled indignation against the guilty cause of it. George had indeed been the victim of Miss Gibson's perfidy and cruelty, but she was unjustly blamed, almost in entirety, for George's death. Ironically, with George being out of the way, William Smart decided that there was now no hurry to marry Miss Gibson, and the marriage was repeatedly delayed until late November. 
After the marriage took place, she and William Smart travelled down south. On their return, they landed publicly at the harbour in Montrose. But she sadly misreckoned public opinion, for the people rose on them, and they were forced to take refuge in the Star Inn of New Wind from the violence of the mob. Naturally, however, these manifestations of popular indignation ceased to be shown, and the turbulent feeling settled down into something altogether different. Her impiously trampling on the most solemn oaths, her refined cruelty towards her tragic victim, and her defiance of every obligation held sacred by man came to be well known, and the feeling of people toward Miss Gibson may be summed up by the words horror and disgust. It was remarked of her that, after her marriage, she walked in the streets of Montrose with a defiant air as if she scorned public opinion. This shows that she was well aware of the general feeling. Despite her marriage to the loathsome William Smart, she was only ever referred to as Miss Gibson. She had made a shipwreck of her happiness, and her future held not a happy day. Smart, not having received the degree of wealth he had anticipated, as Miss Gibson's inheritance was in consuls, which are consolidated annuities, or government bonds, and paid out annually, treated his wife with great carelessness and neglect. On one occasion they were travelling to Edinburgh on one of the steamers, and Miss Gibson was sitting in a seat on the quarter-deck, wretchedly sick and cold, while her husband walked up and down with other male passengers, paying no attention to her whatsoever. There happened to be a horse hirer from Montrose, who went by the name of Babylon, also heading to Edinburgh. Seeing her so miserably cold and abandoned, Babylon offered her his cloak, and no creature, according to him, was ever more grateful, even although it was from a man she would not have deigned to look at in any other circumstances. In the face of such cold and unloved treatment by an ignoble and mercenary troglodyte like William Smart, over time, Miss Gibson gradually regained her soul and senses. The love of her life was George Beatty, and she became agonizingly aware of this fact and reality. When residing at Castlestad, a mansion at the top of the Montrose High Street, where the castle had once stood. The unhappy couple could be seen every afternoon, driving through the town in a dog-cart at a furious rate, with a groom riding a considerable way ahead to clear the way. They would return from the country about an hour later, driving in the same manner. The ladies in Montrose stood aloof and did not associate with Miss Gibson. She was often in the society of the late Lady Panmure, and of course she had a circle of her own in which she moved. Her life stretched to a point seventeen years later than the death of George. That tragic event, and the romantic friendship of the two preceding years, with her own subsequent conduct, had become indelibly fixed in her memory, ever haunting her remaining days. For the last two years of her life she was confined to the house by a lingering illness, and lately was unable to leave her room. A circumstance which had existed before now became too dreadful to be borne. She had always had a horror of being in the dark, and now she thought she could see the image of George Beatty in it. Now when she was altogether unable to leave her bed, she could never endure to be left alone for even a moment, and required one of the maid-servants always to stay with her and to sleep in the same room. For two long years the dark clouds gathered and hung over her with perpetual gloom. The selfish apathy of William Smart was cold cheer to a hopeless sufferer, and formed a painful contrast to the devoted kindness and love of George Beatty. Her heart would now sink at the thought of what a dupe and fool she had been, 
how she had destroyed all her bright dreams of happiness, and been guilty of such wickedness for the sake of an object of ambition, and what a poor, paltry thing it had turned out to be. Horror of conscience, remorse, and despair filled her tormented mind. At the moment of her death in her forty-second year, on January 22, 1840, it is recorded that she cried out the name of her true love, George Beatty. On the death of his wife, William Smart made the appearance of being overwhelmed with grief, although it was palpable to everybody that he had been the opposite of kind to her. Wearing a white cravat, weepers, a long crepe hanging down to the middle of his back, and a rueful countenance, for a long time he went almost every day to visit her grave in the new cemetery at Rose Hill, of which she had been the very first internment. For over a year he went about the streets in this garb, making himself an object of attention, but every one disbelieved him. In going into the old church of Montrose, he would walk along the passage with a slow and solemn air in the same deep morning, and come in late with a view of attracting attention, letting his grief be known to all men. He even went to the continent to supposedly wear away his sorrow. He wished to create the impression that between himself and his wife there was a mutual and an endearing affection, but everybody knew that was a lie. On her tomb he inscribed, William, the beloved wife of William Smart, etc. However, the story of their life was too well known for the popular mind to be deceived by lying monuments. The abominable Isabel Gibson, the mother of Miss Gibson, survived her daughter by five years, expiring on December 25, 1845, and though William Smart had been neglectful of his wife, knowing where the money lay, he paid extraordinary attention to the old woman who had been alone in the house of Canaber since the death of her husband Robert on May 8th. 1828. He became heir to her money also. William Smart thus succeeded in feathering his nest as he had always sought to. His memory will be disdained by every noble mind. He died with all his sins at Montrose in 1853, aged sixty-seven, supposedly a miserable, withered wreck. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What, indeed? Due to his supposed suicide, legally George could only be buried between the hours of nine o'clock and midnight without religious ceremony. However, Reverend Dr. Keith felt privileged and honoured to give service to his respected and lamented friend. On Friday, October 3rd, George was tenderly laid to rest at the spot he had departed this world, in the same grave as his siblings, Joseph, Elizabeth, and Mary. Were those who loved him the most silently gathered in the cold, misty autumn moonlight, it was a heartbreakingly solemn event. One year later, to the day of his burial, when the earth around George's grave had settled sufficiently, his closest friends had a beautiful and impressive monument of polished granite erected upon it, surrounded by a three-feet-high stone enclosure with iron railings surmounted by a chevaux de frise, which is a protective row of spikes to prevent intrusion. A marble tablet on its northeast face bears an inscription, penned by his best friend, James Burnest Esquire, which could not be more profoundly impassioned or panegyrical, but sadly having not been commissioned by his own family, amidst the names of the siblings with whom he now shares eternity. <laughs>
until the death of William Smart, and five years later his brother George. The true story of George Beatty was totally suppressed by these and other socially powerful elitist reprobates in Montrose. George's family were pressured, harassed, and threatened into silence, with every possible measure being taken to erase his memory. But thanks to a concerted effort by his friends and confederates to preserve the truth, George's written statements were laboriously and meticulously duplicated by hand numerous times. It is customary and natural to say a last word over our departed friends when they are committed to the dust. At George's funeral service, the Reverend Dr. Alexander Keith relayed a poignant, albeit perceivably trifling story, which demonstrated George's inherent goodness and the kindness of his heart. There was a poor man named Jamie Calder, nearly blind, who often sat in the Montrose churchyard bray asking alms. Every day, George remembered to give this poor man some money, and if any day he happened to be engaged elsewhere, the next day he made it up. George Beatty was universally beloved, and this cannot be without a cause. He who made himself loved by all must have had a warm and generous nature, and the very finest spontaneities of heart and mind. This fact was profoundly and sincerely immortalized in an obituary written by the impartial public journalist of the Montrose Review. Certain souls are incarnated on the physical plane in order that others may be spiritually and morally tested, and ultimately proven as positive or negative in essence. As with so many, George Beatty was a literal martyr to the virtues of integrity, honor, compassion, and love. And no regressive agenda, intent, or machination will ever alter that fact. For the duration of his relatively short lifespan, this bleak and harsh world was brighter, enlightened, enhanced, and blessed by his presence. He died beloved by the right people, and persecuted by those who were devoid of the virtues he had himself epitomized and embodied. The tapestry of his life may be viewed with innumerable loose threads from this earthly perspective. However, when ultimately viewed from the other side, a picture depicting immense beauty and divine revelation will surely be beheld by all. Epilogue The two final poems penned by George Beatty just prior to his tragic death on September 29, 1823, are as follows. The Appeal Say what is worse than black despair. Tis that sick hope too weak for flying, That plays at fast and loose with care, And wastes a weary life in dying. Though promised to be a welcome guest, Yet it may be too late a comer, Tis but a cuckoo voice at best, The joy of spring, scarce heard in summer. Then now consent this very hour, let the kind word of peace be spoken, Like dew upon a withered flower, Is comfort to the heart that's broken, The heart whose will is from above, May yet its mortal taint discover, For time, which cannot alter love, Hath power to kill the hapless lover. Farewell, Sonnet. Farewell, maid, thy love has vanished, Gone off like the morning dew. Farewell, maid, my peace is banished, Adieu, a sad, a long adieu. Weary world, 
I now must leave thee. Sun and moon, a long farewell. Farewell, maid, no more I'll grieve thee. Soon you'll hear my funeral knell. Soon the lips that oft have kissed thee, Mouldering in the dust will lie, And the heart that oft hath blessed thee, Soon must cease to heave a sigh. Soon the tongue that still rehearses All thy beauty, fickle fair, Soon the hand that writes these verses Shall to kindred dust repair. Friends that constant were and true, I fare you well, my race is run. Heartless, lorn, benighted, weary, Every earthly hope is gone. Gloomy grave, you'll soon receive me, all my sorrows here shall close. Here no fickle fair shall grieve me. Here my heart shall find repose. In conclusion, a short poem by this author. Shades Like the palest shades of evening, we are fading with the light. As the sun serenely settles, Yielding gently to the night. Like the whispered breath of angels On a sky of winter grey, Our essence in a breeze divine To heaven drifts away. In realms of pastoral radiance, A song but dreamt before, we dwell in timeless rhapsody, Where light shall fade no more. Good night, sweet prince. This has been Blood Beyond the Rose, the George Beatty story, written by Barry Dominic Graham, narrated by Peter Baker, copyright 2017 by Barry Dominic Graham, production copyright 2017 by Barry Dominic Graham.